session and then I think we'll have some time to immerse ourselves in the monastic world that we find ourselves in and maybe we'll close out uh, by gathering together again and then finally culminate with eating together. So greetings and salutations to all of you. Welcome to the Gateway to Heaven. I really like that name. Uh, Gateway to Heaven, St. John the Baptist and St. Arsema, Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Monastery. Of course, St. John the Baptist is a biblical saint and St. Arsema is a post-biblical saint from our sister church in Armenia. And we find ourselves here in the Gada, in two senses of that word. So I'm sure you guys already know it, but humor me, Steve. What about you? Gadam Baru? Gadam. One more time. Say Gadam. Gadam. Gadam has two meanings. Very important. The first meaning of Gadam is the wilderness. Okay? So for example, you'll hear in the Gospels that the Lord Jesus Christ goes to Gadama Korontos. Guess what? There were no monasteries back then. So what is it talking about? He went into the wilderness of Corinth in modern day Greece, right? That's what he's talking about, going to the wilderness in some areas. That's what it means, first meaning. Built upon that meaning, we get the second meaning. Because with the early desert fathers, especially of Egypt and of Syria, right? Again, our sister churches, in Alexandria and Antioch, but especially outside the city, in the wilderness, Monks started to go, holy people started to go outside of the city so that they could try to find some spirituality, try to find some knowledge and life and love that couldn't be provided for them in the city. I'll rephrase that, it could be, but maybe it's harder. And so the same way children put on training wheels on their bicycles, or they have regular bicycles, and they put their bumpers in bowling, before they go bowling. I had some SPED students I was with earlier this week. We had bowling. They had bumpers and they were amazing. You need practice. And so sometimes we use the wilderness of practice. One of my favorite fathers amongst the saints, Kapusianis Ahorik, Saint John Chrysostom, or the Golden Mouth, he was in the wilderness or living a life of monasticism for a long time. And he had to be dragged into the city to teach the people because people knew how much of a great teacher he was. And we find ourselves in California on that wonderful uh, Rio Grande, El Camino Real, or the real road, which is a great Spanish translation for the word orthodoxy itself. And on El Camino Real, you have all these different old churches established by the Spanish when they first came here hundreds of years ago. And the particular one we passed on our way here, from if we're coming from SoCal, maybe from NorCal is different, or from Vegas, I see some friends from all over, was the San Miguel. And that's the name of the, the local city right here. Of course, that means that it's named after St. Michael, or Tempus Mikael. And we'll see him appear in some of the readings that we're gonna go over today. But it's blessings upon blessings. We're gonna learn a few words here today. We already learned Gadam which is good. Now let's practice our Hebrew. And sometimes this word pops up in Giddens too, so it's good. Everyone say, Bamidbar. 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 That's the Hebrew word for in the wilderness. You'll notice in Hebrew, ba, they use the same way we do. So really all you had to learn was midbar, because you already knew ba. So we have gadam for wilderness and for monasteries. And in Hebrew we have Bamidbar, or in the wilderness. In the... Uh, Hebrew naming of the various books of the Bible, and you see this in our tradition too with Mazmur Dawi. Instead of saying like the Greek names, like the first five books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they use the first few words of that book when they name it. So Numbers, for example, the book we call Numbers, Ori Zahulk, is called in Hebrew, Bamidbar, in the wilderness. If you go and open the book of Numbers, or Ori Zahulk, the first few words are Bagadam, Bamidbar, in the wilderness. And so I want to go through a few different passages of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament to show what the wilderness means. For your reference, you don't need to memorize this, but just for your general knowledge and information, Genesis has 
seven words or seven sources or seven references to the wilderness, to the Gada, to the Midbar. And that's in the first section of the Bible called the Torah or the instruction. In the second section of the Bible, it's called the Nabi'im. Sounds like our word, Nabi. The prophets, you have 14 references in the book of Ezekiel. Or to me to this kid, which I named my son after. A great book. I recommend it. <laughs> the third section of the Bible is the Ketubim, which is also related to our word Kitab, or book. It's like the miscellaneous writings, the other section. And in that section, in the Psalms in Mazmur Dawit, which by the way in Hebrew it means more. Look how close that is. In that section, you have 22 references to the wilderness. I'm just going to pick one from each of these sections and we'll learn a little bit. I'll start with Genesis. So this is Genesis chapter 16. If you have a Bible of your own, whether print or digital, you can follow along. I'm just going to read Genesis chapter 16 for us. Sarai, the wife of Abram, had not born children for him. She had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, Look, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in, therefore, to my maid, so you may have children from her. Abram listened to her voice. And Sarai, the wife of Abram, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. She gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife for him. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And she saw that she was pregnant, and her mistress was dishonored before her. Sarai said to Abram, I am being wronged by you. I have given my maid into your bosom. But when she saw that she was pregnant, I was dishonored before her. May God judge between me and you, Abram said to Sarai. Look, your maid is before you. You may use her however is pleasing to you. And Sarai mistreated her, or abused her, and she fled from her presence. Here Micaiah jumps in. And an angel of the Lord God found her at the spring of water, Bamibah, Bagada, in the wilderness, at the spring on the way to Shur. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Hagar, maid of Sarai, where are you coming from and where are you going? And she said, I am escaping the presence of Sarai, my mistress. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and humble yourself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Increasing, I will increase your offspring and will not be countable because of the great number. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Look, you are pregnant and you will bear a son, and call his name Ishmael. Wayne, Yismael. Because the Lord has noticed your humiliation, he will be a rustic person. His hands will be against all, and the hands of all will be against him. And he will dwell in opposition to all his brothers. And Hagar called the name of the Lord who was speaking to her. You are the God who watches over me. Because she said, because I even saw in person the one who appeared to me. On this account she called the well, where I saw in person. Look, it is between Kadesh and Barat. And Hagar brought forth a son for Abram. And Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar brought forth for him, Ishmael. This is incredible, okay? Not in every instance where you see the angel of the Lord is it Mikael. But more often than not in the Old Testament, it is referring to Micaiah. And again, in Hebrew, just so you keep seeing how close it is to our language, they're cousins, like Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. That's how good it is in Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic are. He's called Malak Yahweh. What's the word for angel in Gu'uz? <laughs> Malak Yahweh or Malak Adonai, the angel of the Lord. Okay? So the angel of the Lord, Malak Xavier, he meets her. Where does he meet her? At the um, spring well. At the spring well in the wilderness. In the wilderness. The spring well is not in the city. It's in the wilderness. So he met her in the wilderness. 
and he blessed her after she had been mistreated, after she had been abused. He met her there in the wilderness. And not only did he just like comfort her with a few words, but he blessed her and said, your offspring will be innumerable. We won't even be able to count it. Remember, I told you, this is another connection, by the way, this is Genesis, but you already see its connection. Orit Zahulk, or numbers, is about numbers, it's about counting and innumerableness, right? And it begins with the words, in the wilderness. And the book is called, in, in the wilderness. And here Hagar is told, in the wilderness, that her descendants will be uncountable. And she's not even the wife of promise. She's not Sarah. This is before they're even renamed. This is before they're Sarah and Abraham. This is when they're Sarai and Abram. It's absolutely incredible. She did nothing wrong. She was obedient to her masters. Her masters abused her. She cried and ran away. And the angel of the Lord meets her in the wilderness to bless her. So whatever your background is when you're here, wherever you came from and wherever you are going, God could send his angel of the Lord to bless you here in the wilderness. Furthermore, this is incredible. This is before the full revelation of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in which you get the body form of God in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All she knows is that God is spirit. Here's the thing about spirits. They don't have eyes. They don't have ears. What does she end up naming her son? Ishmael, Yismael. Look how close that is. God hears me. So God, who is spirit, has no ears. In her day, all the various deities and all the little cities, the way we have sports teams, right? Someone named their favorite sports team. Just blurred it. Lakers. Yeah. Lakers. <laughs> Chelsea, Clippers, what's going on? Arsenal, <laughs> whatever sports team you had for each city, like that back in the day in the Middle East, each city had their own god. And each of those gods had a statue, which is the taot, the idol, that they would literally bow down before to worship. And guess what? Those statues have ears. And those statues have eyes, but they can't hear and they can't see. Praise be to God who has no ears, and yet she named her son, God Hears. And then she named the place, God Sees and God Saw Me, and yet God has no eyes. No eyes and he can see better than anyone. No ears and yet he can hear better than anyone. The idols have eyes and ears. And they can't see and they can't hear. Glory to God for that passage. The next one is from Ezekiel. My Hebrew teacher is Father Paul Nadim Tarazi. He taught for decades at St. Vladimir's in, uh, in New York. But he also taught in Lebanon and in Romania. He's the most prolific Orthodox Christian biblical scholar in the world. Palestinian, you know what his people are going through right now. From Jaffa, 81 years ago. That's before the creation of the state. We're not going to talk about that. And he always, for his Misahada Juch, for his uh, children that are receiving repentance advice, he always recommends, before you come to me, read Ezekiel 16, and if you haven't had enough, read Ezekiel 20. So I'll relay the same advice that he gave me. And we're going to read Ezekiel 20 together. I'll just read 1 to 17. It's a long passage. So I'll keep it shorter. Ezekiel 20. And this happened in the seventh year in the 15th of the month. Some men of the elders of the house of Israel came to inquire of the Lord, and they sat before my face. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, I'll, I'll just add, this is too much Hebrew already, but I'll just add. The word in Hebrew for word of the Lord is Dabar, Adonai. And Devad is related to Mifad in the wilderness. It's the word of judgment, which comes from a senior to a junior, to a judge in the wilderness. And even though we don't have this exact word in our culture, if you go outside the traditional courthouses, 
and you see where Shimgana Na and all types of reconciliation work and judgment is done in the rural countryside of Ethiopia, they often do it under a tree in the wilderness, like a tree over there. They'll be over there and they'll gather on a mountainous highland region, right? Remember, Ethiopia has 70% of Africa's highlands. It's a crazy stat. And in those highlands where the trees are, old men would usually sit there and judge the communities. Have you guys seen the crazy movie Difra, right? About some Alafa uh, Bahan, which is a terrible part of the culture. They show that in the film. They show the judges under the tree in the traditional dispute resolution centers in Ethiopia. So it's very much related to that. And so when the word of the Lord comes to the prophet Ezekiel, it's very much bringing that judgment in the wilderness. And Sirwak uh, Alu, the, the root word, is the same. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel, and you shall say to them, This is what the Lord says. Do you come to inquire of me? As I live, I will surely not answer you, says the Lord. Shall I punish them with punishment? Son of man, warn against them regarding the transgressions of their fathers. And you shall say to them, this is what the Lord says. From the day when I chose the house of Israel and was made known to the seed of the house of Jacob and became known to them in the land of Egypt and took hold of them by my hand, saying, I am the Lord your God. In that day I took hold of them by my hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt into the land which I prepared for them, a land flowing with milk and honey. It is a honeycomb beyond all the earth. And I said to them, let everyone throw away the abominations of the eyes and do not be defiled by the practices of Egypt. That's when they're in diaspora. Perfect for us because we're in diaspora. But I acted in order that my name should absolutely not be profaned before the nations in the middle of whom they are, among whom I was made known to them before them to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And I led them into the wilderness or the desert. And I gave them my ordinances and I made my duties known to them, which a person shall do and live by them. And I gave them my Sabbaths to become a sign between me and between them that they might know that I am the Lord who is making them holy. And I said to the house of Israel in the desert or in the wilderness, walk in my ordinances. And they did not walk in them. And they spurned my duties, which a person shall do and live by them. And they profaned my Sabbaths very much. And I said I would pour out my wrath upon them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted in order that my name should absolutely not be profaned before the nations according to whose eyes I led them. But I lifted my hand against them in the wilderness to absolutely not lead them into the land which I gave them, a land flowing with milk and honey, a honeycomb beyond every land, because they spurned my duties and they did not walk in my ordinances. And they keep profaning my Sabbaths and they kept going after the thoughts of their heart. And my eye had pity on them from destroying them. And I did not make an end of them in the desert. What's incredible here now is you see judgment. Earlier we saw in Genesis blessing in the wilderness. Now what do we see in the wilderness? Judgment. And what, what makes the Bible such a unique text, it's different than any other text, any other epic is you go to any society any culture look up their poems look up their famous epics and poems you know recently it's a tough subject because of mental health issues and i think greater than that spiritual health issues in the past year two americans have lit themselves on fire it's called self-immolation this is actually a buddhist and hindu practice it's a spiritual practice from a different religion that of course in our religion we would consider demonic to do something like that, right? And that their gods are no gods at all, but demons, okay? And they, they couched it in political language, but really it's a mental health and spiritual health issue, okay? You can go, their manifestos are online. You can read what they're trying to do. 
One of them said he was upset about the war in the Middle East. The other one was upset about cryptocurrencies. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up. And to me, it's mental health and spiritual health, okay? But they have these spiritual practices that they picked up because they rejected the Christianity of their homeland and looked for something in Eastern religion. Not our type of Eastern, but from South Asia or the Indian subcontinent, right? And it's crazy because I watched, there's a famous Indian movie about communities in their context where it makes sense that they do something like that. But these are white Americans picking that up, right? Because they're picking up foreign practices. This is what Ezekiel is being used as a tool to accuse the people of Israel of. When they're in Egypt, when they're in Babylon, when they're in foreign diaspora, when they're in other places, instead of holding on to the teachings of God, they start picking up the teachings of the people around them. And so God gave them judgment. But imagine this. Whatever epic you go to in any of these epics, in any other religion, in any culture, the first thing they tell you is how great their forefathers were. Even in the church, we picked up this culture and we talk about how great the patristics are, how great the fathers are. I know Kala Abrizullah, he could tell you later when he MCs. How great all the fathers are, how perfect they are. And in the founding of America, right? Whether you like it or not, what do they say? This is what our founding fathers did. George Washington never lied. Abraham Lincoln loved black people. Look into it. This is what they say. They say how great their forefathers are. What does the Bible say? It says all of them failed. All of them were worthy of judgment. All of them were worthy of being destroyed. The good thing God had the rainbow after Noah and said, I won't use this again, a flood, to destroy you. Doesn't mean I won't destroy you by another means but I won't use a flood. And in this case, he said, not because any of you are good, but because of my name, because they know you belong to me. And because if I destroy you all, you all would be running a poor public relations or PR campaign on my name. So that my name looks good, I'm gonna save some of you. I'm gonna save a remnant so that you're a witness and you could tell those who were judged. And again, in Genesis, you have blessing in the wilderness. In Ezekiel, you have judgment in the wilderness. But along with this judgment is this second chance, this second opportune moment to change, to turn towards God, to get closer to Him. So yes, there's judgment in the wilderness, but you also have an opportunity to change. As long as you are still breathing, and judgment day hasn't occurred, the final judgment, God is giving you a second chance. He's long suffering. He's very patient. And we're gonna see that in the next passage, which is from Psalm 135, if you have the Greek text, Psalm 136, if you have the Hebrew text. And this one, in the Greek tradition, they call it the poly Elios, and they sing it, it's very beautiful. In our tradition, we usually will call it Ismala Alam And we take this line and we say it every time after we say Sibhat or glory to God after we've eaten. We'll probably say it today after we eat. Maybe one of our wonderful turbaned brothers will say it in a nice fashion. But say it with me, Isti. Say Ismala Alam Mihratu. Ismala Alam Mihratu. Ismala Alam Mihratu. That means his loving kindness is everlasting or his mercy endures forever. Is to say, his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. So in this long song, every other line is or his mercy endures forever. Just cause I'm gonna hope one of you goes and studies Hebrew. Mm -hmm. See, and notice by the way, one of these words is the same at least. Say, ki, ki, la olam, that's Ismala Alam Mihratu, or His mercy endures forever. So that's you're going to hear that a bunch of times in this psalm. I'm only going to read a few of the verses here, and we'll be done. Psalm 135 in the Greek text, 136 in the Hebrew. 
give thanks. Actually, no, let's make this interactive. We can make this interactive. Uh, when I point to you, I want you to say, Ismala ala muhratu. Okay? <laughs> give thanks to the Lord because He is kind. Ismala ala muhratu. Give thanks to the God of Gods. Ismala ala muhratu. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. To the one who alone makes great wondrous things. To the one who made the heavens with understanding. To the one who made firm the earth upon the water. To the one who alone made great lights. The sun for authority over the day. The moon and the stars for authority over the night. To the one who struck Egypt with their firstborn. And the one who led out Israel from the middle of them. With a strong hand and with a high arm. To the one who divided the Red Sea into parts. And the one who carried Israel in the middle of it. And to the one who scattered Pharaoh and his strength. To the one who carried his people in the wilderness. We'll stop there. So, in Genesis, you saw that he blesses those mistreated and abused in the wilderness. In Ezekiel, he judges those worthy of judgment and gives them an opportune moment to turn around, to change and to stop walking in a manner that is not in accordance with his ordinances, but to start walking in his camino real, his real road, his right road. And in Psalm 135 slash 136, with his mercy enduring forever, again, we hear the story of the angel of the Lord, or Mikai. You see this in a lot of Mikai icons, by the way. I pointed this out in Vegas, remember when I, I came by you guys not too long ago, last Hidan, last November. And you see in the icon, Mikael guiding the Israelites, because God sent him to guide them through the Red Sea to escape Pharaoh. And in Psalm 135, what do we hear? It says God led them out. Because God sent Mikael or Malak Adonai, Malak Yahweh, he sends the angel of the Lord. And so he gets the credit. I'll give you two examples from two past presidents. When Osama bin Laden was killed, I don't know if you remember where you were, I do, and I remember watching it on the news. Obama came out in a strut and he announced it. Did Obama fire the shot that killed Osama bin Laden? No. But he's the commander in chief. So he got the credit for it. Iran is in the news again for bad things. If you remember, this was more recent, when Trump was president, they killed General Soleimani. Did Trump out there kill General Soleimani? No. Who got the credit? Trump got the credit. The commander. So even though you have these lackeys, these minions, these henchmen that you sent out, who do your dirty work for you, if you will, or who, who are there in the dirt, the one above them gets the credit. And so God gets credit in the wilderness and through the wilderness for providing salvation, for providing deliverance, for providing rescue to his people. From what? From bondage, from slavery in Egypt. So what? They can have freedom and liberty? No. So that they could be in bondage to him and worship him in the wilderness. That's what he wanted. That's why he was not in a rush. You think it takes 40 years to get to the Holy Land from Egypt? It doesn't. Not, definitely not now, and not back then. He took them round and round because he wanted them to get used to, as I was saying, the training wheels or the bumpers from bowling. He wanted them to practice in the wilderness so that they could get ready to go back to the city. If they're holy enough, they could stay in the wilderness. There are many, many holy fathers who've just done that and stayed in the wilderness. But some of us are weak. We can take a little bit of time here, but then we got to get back to the city. Since we're here, I want to quote from you from Mas'af Manokosan, our book of monks. I have two fathers from there. The first is Marisag. 
or Lord Isaac. And this is incredible because I'm going to tell you, I prepared this before something else happened in the news, but I had to touch on it because it's there. And that's where you leave room for the spirit, even when you prepare your teachings. This is from Marisak. Let yourself be persecuted, but do not persecute others. Be crucified, but do not crucify others. Be slandered, but do not slander others. I'm going to throw that last one in a different spin for you. If you know the word diablos, the Greek word from which we get devil, diablos means the slanderer. Simonim Okay? So when you commit slander, who do you look like? You look devilish. You look diabolical. You look like diablos. And so he says to you, be slandered. But do not slander. Be persecuted, but do not persecute. Be crucified, but don't crucify. If you haven't already thought of what could I be possibly thinking, and the saddest thing about this is that I've seen people arguing about minutia of theology. Let me tell you, there's a normal route and a normal road, and that's justice, right? And I'll never say anything other than the Oriental Orthodox Church, the Afro-Asiatic Church, our church communion, the Ethiopians, Eritreans, Egyptians, Armenians, Syrians, and Indians that are in communion with us. However, there's also something called the baptism of blood. And we sing this during every Kaddasi. If you were here during Kaddasi, you would have heard it. We say tazakarko, makama tazakarka, peata uzayama. Remember us, O Lord, in your kingdom, as you remembered the criminal on your right. The criminal on the right did not have a tzimtzum. I'm sorry. He didn't have an atala. He didn't have a cross on his neck because he was on a cross. He was not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He was baptized in the blood of Christ by being crucified next to him and by simply asking him to remember me in your kingdom. And he told them, today you will be with me in paradise. And if you see, I want you to pay attention in, in about a week and a half on Siklat, on Good Friday, pay real close attention. I hope you guys make it. One of my favorite things from that day is we have an extra biblical story and it's called the Kirub and Feata Uzayama or the cherub and the criminal on the right. And if you hear it, it's like 45 minutes long. I know it's a long day on Siklet. It's an amazing story where the criminal on the right, he makes it to paradise. And that kiru, that cherub, that angel with the flaming sword that kicked Adam and Eve out, he sees him and he says, who are you? What set are you from? Where does your grandma stay? He's like, who are you? Are you Adam? Nope. Are you Noah? Nope. Are you any of the righteous? No. Are you a prophet? No. Are you a saint? No. Are you a martyr? No. <laughs> Who are you? And you ask him all these questions. We have this elaborate. A lot of times in our church, we just read it, one person. In the Syriac tradition, they actually do a play. It's very cute. You can look it up online. They have like an actual play. They have little kids do it as a play. I always want us to do it one day. So play idea, if you guys want. Play idea for our church. Take Kiru Ben Feata Wizayaman. Turn it into a play. Very easy. Usually we just have one person read it. Why do I bring that up? That's mercy. The baptism of blood is mercy. If you've seen Mar Mari Emmanuel in the news, he's a bishop of a different church, okay? I'm not going to tell you about his theology right now. I'm not interested in it. But a lunatic, militaristic Islamist, I'll be specific, came at him with a knife as he was preaching mid-sermon. If you have to go, that's not a bad way to go. I know a few kahanat who died during Kaddasi or Mahdi. That's probably top 10 ways to go, to be with your Lord. And he was ready. As the guy was stabbing him, he had his cross and he was blessing him. Once the parishioners pinned him down, the parishioners wanted to like kick him and punch him. Like, how dare you stab our priest? 
and he put his hands on him and started praying over him. This week, he just released a video from like the hospital, just audio only, but it's like came in video format. He said, I'm good, forgive him, I forgave him. Already, automatically. Again, I don't care about anything else in his theology. I'm not interested in justice right now. I'm interested in mercy. And he reminded all of his followers in his flock, and we have a different flock, but obviously there's a lot of overlap. He reminded them this thing that Marisak said. And by the way, Marisak is in the same church as this guy. And he's in our book of monks. So I'll let everyone else square that circle. We have another father from the Mazafa Manokosa, from the book of monks. His name is, in English, John Saba, the spiritual elder. For short, we call him Aragawi Manfasawi. This is what Aragawi Manfasawi says. Hold them in your arms like Mary, his mother. Enter with the Magi, or the wise men, Savasakil, and offer your gifts. Proclaim his birth with the shepherds. Proclaim his praise with the angels. Carry him in your arms like Simeon the elder. Take him with Joseph down to Egypt when he goes to play with little children. Steal up to him and kiss him. Inhale the sweet savor of his body, the body that gives life to everybody. From here you can get a very nice impression of the love and warmth in the writings of Aragawi Manfasawi, or John Saba, the spiritual elder. And you could also remember that as the body, you are his body, Christ, but also every Sunday and sometimes extra, you are offered to eat his body and to drink his body, to have sigawadam. You're offered urban, the opportunity to draw near, to draw closer to God by consuming his flesh and his blood. And so you too can feel that warmth. And you too can feel that love. And to prepare for that, consult your local priest. And the last thing I'll read for you, and I'll end without explaining it, is uh, from tomorrow's reading for Nicodemus, for the associate deacon. It's 1 John chapter 4. 1 John is from the epistle of John. Chapter 4 from verses 19 to the end. It's very clear, that's why I don't need to explain it. It's very obvious, you'll see. Because of this, we know we are of the truth, and we will persuade our hearts of this fact before Him. Because if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. He, oh, excuse me, I'm reading extra. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, but hates their brother or sister, that person is a liar. Insert favorite church, favorite saint, anything. If they say they love this saint, they love this church, they love God, but they hate their brother or sister, they're a liar. Someone who doesn't love a brother or sister whom they have seen, how can they love God? whom they haven't seen. This is the command we have from him. Anyone who loves God should love their brother or sister too. And I'll end with one more monk from the Desert Fathers of Egypt, Abba Pambo. And this is especially for the intelligent ones. So please raise your hand if you're really smart. <laughs> Nobody's really smart? Oh, that's how I know you're smart. You didn't raise your hand. Good job. You're really smart? Abba Pambo's advice. Why? Because if you're really smart, what do you want to do? You want to share how smart you are with the world, whether it's on social media or in person. You want to show people how smart you are by giving advice. Now, this is kind of funny to say, but you'll notice something about the smartest people, the coolest people. It's not actually so easy to access them. And they don't always give out advice so freely because they're so busy. But here's Abba Pambo's advice. And he said this to a seeker one time when you're trying to introduce someone to him. They're like, Abba Pambo, give him some advice. And Abba Pambo of the Egyptian desert, he said, if my silence is not advice enough for him, my speech won't. 
And so those of you who are really smart, even though none of you raise your hands, I, I feel like you're hiding your power level. <laughs> Sometimes you want to think, what's the perfect thing to say in this moment? Sometimes there is no perfect thing to say. And sometimes your silence itself will speak louder than words. It's why also in the book of James or Jacob, it says, be slow to speak and quick to hear. And one of the greatest practices of our fathers, the monks in the wilderness, is practicing being silent. And we'll have time for a silent immersion later Amen.